Hello, my name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church. Just, just a few, uh, a few blocks down the street here, about a quarter of a mile. As you're headed back toward Lawrence, on your left. And friends, uh, come out here with my friend John. We're here to preach the gospel of grace to you. To bring to you the message of life. The message of Jesus Christ. That Jesus saves sinners. That God has sent His Son into the world to redeem those who were lost in sin. My friends, we're here to make much of sin that we might make much of the Savior. We're here to call out sin in its various forms. And to call sinners to repentance. But we're not doing this from a haughty spirit or out of a pride in and of ourselves. No. Friends, we know that we ourselves are sinners, lawbreakers, and we, like you, deserve God's wrath to be poured out on us in hell forever. However, we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Christ on that cross purchased salvation for us. And if He has so purchased it for you, we trust that in due time God will use the means He has set apart and chosen to bring you to saving faith in His Son and to redeem you by His grace. To redeem you by His grace and for His glory. For God will not share His glory with another. And ultimately we are here to ascribe glory to God. To lift up praise to the Lord of hosts. To lift up praise to the God who saves His people. The God who works all things after the counsel of His most holy will. We are here to say, as, as it uh, is written in Luke 2, verses four, uh, verse 14, we are here to say, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. My friends, we come out here out of a deep care for your souls out of a great brokenness for your souls we don't want you to die in your sins we don't want you to perish in hell forever instead it is our strong desire it is the prayer of our hearts that you would be born from above that God in his tender mercy would save you from your sins and so we ask we plead we exhort you to repent and believe upon Christ for eternal life, for eternal salvation from sin. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon is in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And the Apostle Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He says these words as he is writing. But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to His glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. John! The sign. The sign over here fell. Thank you, thank you. And here Paul is speaking of our sin and God's truth. God's truth and our sin. And ultimately even a manifestation of divine justice. That God manifests His righteousness in light of of our sin and he does it with justice he does it with purity and holiness in fact in the previous verses he spoke of that idea that is God just the question was is God just in punishing the sinner for their sin and the, the question the answer is yes absolutely God is just in all his ways righteous in all his deeds there's not a single thing which he does that is wrong not a single thing at all in all his ways he is perfect and in all his deeds, he is righteous, my friends.
And Paul even presents a rhetorical question here at the end of verse 7. Why am I still being judged as a sinner? It is because God is a just God. Because God is a just judge. That's why in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, in verse 5, Paul writes, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, he's speaking here to the religious hypocrite, he says, You are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. My friend, here Paul presents the idea that God, the truth that God is certainly, in all His ways, righteous, perfect, holy. And therefore, let us not think so little of God as to think that He is not just or that He is not righteous. For to do so is a great, grievous evil against God. To have wrong belief concerning the Most High is a great offense to Him. That's why in Nahum chapter 1, it says in verse 2, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is His way, and the clouds are the dust beneath His feet. My friends, here we see the idea the, the, the solid truth that we must stand upon and we must realize concerning God that in all His ways He is just. And we see that justice ultimately manifested in the gospel of grace. Ultimately manifested in the cross of Jesus Christ where God demonstrated His righteousness as Paul says in Romans 3. That God put His righteousness on display to show us that He does not sweep sin under the rug but publicly, justly punishes it. It shows us that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so ultimately it is these truths which I want to consider from this passage and then to draw it all the way back to the gospel of grace. To let this text of Scripture point us as an arrow to the cross of Christ where the love of God is manifested, where the grace of God has been manifested for the glory of God. But before we do that, I would like to consider the context of these two verses here in Romans 3, to consider what surrounds these two passages, what has come before and what is going to come after them. What is Paul's argument he's presenting? I hinted at it in the introduction, my friends, that here in the previous verses, Paul is presenting this idea that though we are sinners and we are judged by God, that is not a manifestation of injustice. That's a manifestation of God's justice. That's why in verse 5 he says, If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is He? I am speaking in human terms. And then he says in verse 6, May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world. So, so the, the argument being presented here is if God is unjust, then how can God judge the world? Well, of course He is not unjust and therefore He can judge the world and He will judge the wicked. My friends, the only way you can escape the judgment of God is through believing upon Christ. That's why in John 3 it says in verse 18, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's a sense in which they're judged already and then there's a coming judgment. The final judgment in which they will be thrown into hell for their sins. But the gates of heaven are open wide, my friends, for those who believe upon Christ, who embrace Jesus Christ, who embrace Jesus for all of who He is and for what He has said, for what He has done who do not take offense at Him as His own family did, as those of His own household were. Instead, they see Him as the all-sufficient Savior who saves His people from their sins. But going back to uh, the text at hand, so He says uh, there at the end of verse 6, How will God judge the world? Then He says in verse 7, He presents and continues this argument which we would now consider 
consider those realities with me of our sin and God's justice, God's righteousness, God's truth. So he says in verse 7, he begins, or I should say continues on here. He says, but if through my lie the truth of God abounded to His glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? In other words, what he's saying is this, if my lie, in other words, my sin, if my sin, if through my sin God's truth abounded to His glory, what's he saying here? He's referencing the fact that God's justice, God's righteousness, God's holiness is revealed in the judgment of the wicked, my friends. The, the judgment of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. That's what Paul, exactly what he says in verse 18 of chapter 1. See, God is glorified in the punishment of the wicked. God is glorified in administering judgment upon the wicked. And that is what Paul is referencing there in verse 7. He says, he asks the rhetorical question, Why am I also still being judged as a sinner? Because God is the God of truth and justice and holiness. That is why, because God in His perfection must hold the wicked accountable for their sin. And then he references something interesting in verse 8. He says, And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim we say, let us do evil that good may come. So apparently people in Paul's day had, had accused him of preaching licentiousness. That basically because God shows grace, and because God shows mercy to the wicked, then we can do and behave however we want. We can act in any sort of way that we desire because God is gracious. Such teaching will damn souls. God's grace is never meant for us to trample it underfoot. God's grace is never meant to be perverted and twisted and changed into licentiousness. God's grace frees from the power of sin. That's why many who say they know Christ in churches today, here in the South, who sit in churches week after week and hear the preaching, of Scripture, perhaps maybe very weak preaching, but nonetheless, some, some truth they're hearing from Scripture. <coughs> Yet we find that they take the grace of God and they trample it underfoot. They say, well, because God is gracious, we can do however we want. Such behavior is evil and wicked in the eyes of God. And apparently Paul, from his detractors, had been accused of, of preaching such. But Paul says at the end of that verse there, he says, their condemnation is just. So, in other words, he's saying, what they're saying about us is wrong, it's a lie, it's untrue. My friends, do not, and this is very applicable for you, do not take God's grace and trample it underfoot. That is not what it is for. That's why Jude warned in, in Jude chapter 1 verse 4, he says, for certain per persons have crept in unnoticed those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. There are many who take the grace of God and trample it underfoot. Do not be one of these people and lose your soul, my friends. Instead, truly believe on Christ and receive true saving grace that saves from both the power and effect of sin upon the life of the recipient of it. Why is licentiousness such an evil thing? Why is unholiness and, un and unrighteous behavior and perversion such a filthy thing in the eyes of God? Why is that?
It's because it is in contradiction to the character of God. These things are in contradiction to the perfect character of the Almighty God of glory. Hypocrisy is condemned by God, condemned by the Lord Jesus in His ministry. Why? Because it is in contradiction to the character of God. God is not self-contradicting. And therefore, for people to be self-contradicting is an, a great an offense to God. It's a great offense to Him. We must understand the character of God. I'll go back to Nahum chapter 1 as I was there earlier. Nahum 1, because it... it gloriously reveals the character of God to us. Nahum 1, it says in verse 2, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. So here we find God is a just God. He's wrathful. He brings wrath upon the wicked and judgment upon the wicked. He says in verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Great in power, my friends. Slow to anger. God is patient. Patient with the wicked. God is, is giving the wicked time to repent. So flee to Christ while time is still available for you. While there is still time. The days are counting down, my friends. Every day that passes is a day closer to that ultimate day when God will judge the wicked for their sins. When God will judge the unrighteous for their unrighteousness. And then he even says at the end of verse 3, And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Here we find these attributes of God put right next to one another because they are in no way contradictory. For those people who say, well, God is gracious and compassionate. He is merciful and therefore we can act and behave as that however we want. Such people have forgotten that God is a just and holy God. A righteous God. The God of glory. And He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Licentiousness is evil because it rejects the perfect character of God. It rejects the righteous character of God, my friends. God is so holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holy means sacred, set apart, sanctified. God is set apart from all that is perverse and wicked and evil. God is set apart from all that is ungodly. All that is unrighteous. And in His ways, in His dealings, in everything, everything, He is just and holy. It is true that God is gracious and compassionate. As I've already mentioned, and as I read there out of Nahum chapter 1, that God is slow to anger, is patient with the wicked, but that does not negate His justice and His holiness. That does not throw aside His justice and His holiness. And in that holiness, God has given His law. God has given His Ten Commandments, my friends. You, if you have grown up in church, you know the law of God. You shall not lie or steal. You shall not blaspheme God as they're given in Exodus chapter 20. Why were these commands given, my friends? Why, were, why was God so inclined to bring about his law to give us his commands it is because it shows us the perfect character of God it shows us the perfect character of God the law of God shows us his holy character consider the commands my friends God says you shall not lie God is not a liar. The book of Hebrews says it is impossible for God to lie. God, Why does God say you shall not steal? Because God owns all things. He has a divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with His creation. 
And surely God is not a thief. Surely God does not have that perversion within Him. Or another command, you shall not commit idolatry. In other words, you shouldn't worship another God. You shouldn't worship anything else besides God. You shouldn't put anything else in your life before God. That's because God is a jealous God. Jealous for worship. Jealous for praise and honor. Not that He needs that, but He's worthy of it. He's worthy of our worship of Him. Worthy of it, my friends. And God's law shows us something else. God's law shows us that we are not able to stand before God. That we are not perfect. That we are greatly imperfect. That we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. God is angry with the wicked every day, my friends. Do not think that God is in the heavens toiling and sweating over the fact that you are resisting His will. No man can resist His will. Those who are in opposition to the Lord are the objects of His wrath and the objects of His anger. Fear the Lord, my friends. Flee to Christ. See, we got to fear God. I fear fire. I'm not going to run through a bonfire. It's because I fear the fire. I fear the flames. I reverence them. How much more God? Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a, a consuming fire, a jealous God. We ought to reverence God. We ought to fear Him. Let us not dare double-cross God or try and placate God or try and, and bribe God, my friends. We must repent and flee to Jesus Christ. That is the only way that a sinner can receive pardon because Jesus died on the cross and satisfied the wrath of God against sin. And He rose again three days later. And all who believe on Him will be forgiven on account of His atoning work at the cross. But going back to the law of God, so we see these commands, you shall not lie. We ask ourselves, whoa, have I lied? Absolutely we have lied. Don't lie again and say you have not lied. You shall not steal. If you've stolen something, even if it was something that was small, that is sin in the eyes of God. Have you ever blasphemed God's name? Have you ever used God's name in a sentence in the place of a, a curse word? That's dishonoring to God and that's irreverent toward God. It's not respectful. Or well, here's one. Jesus said in Matthew 5, He said, If you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery with her in your heart. And God condemned adultery. He said it was a sin. And in fact, in the Old Testament, that's one of the Ten Commandments. So if you've looked with lust, you, you, you're seen as an adulterer in the heart. It's because God sees the mind, my friends. God sees the heart. And He sees that it's wicked. Do not say, well, God knows my intent. He knows my heart. He knows I'm a good person. He knows you're a wicked person. He knows you're evil. And that is why Jesus Christ came to save evil sinners, my friends. And because we have broken God's law, we are all, myself included, we are by default condemned to hell. Condemned to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place that is cut off from the presence of God. Jesus said hell is, a, is as in Mark 9, 43, He said it is a place that is the unquenchable fire. It's a place of torment. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we are all condemned there by default without any hope. No amount of good deeds can save us. No amount of going to church or saying prayers. No good thing do we have to present before God that He would say, yes, I am pleased in that, therefore you can come. Because no amount of good that we do can outweigh the bad. No amount of layers of righteousness that we have outside can ever fully cover the sin which we have inwardly. And so, that is why Jesus had to come. God so loved sinners. There is a great love that God has for His church. And so Christ came, eternal God, the true, the, the God-man. Jesus came and took upon Himself flesh. He was born of a virgin, born under the law of God, and He fulfilled the law of God. So when we see those commands, you shall not lie, or steal, or disobey your parents, or dishonor your parents, I should say, and we consider, man, we have broken those commands. But when we think about Jesus, we know He fulfilled those commands. He carried them out perfectly. 
and never broke them once. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And then He went to the cross and was beat and whipped and spat upon. Made a public mockery and nailed to that tree some 2,000 years ago. And there upon that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath of the Father against our sin, the sin of the church, the sin of the people of God was poured out on Christ. Jesus, the innocent one, was treated as if He was a guilty wretch. As if He was a guilty sinner. Though He was perfect. That's why Paul could write in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, he said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. My friends, Christ on that cross became a curse for His people. He bore the wrath of God and He died there and cried out, It is finished! And the wrath of the Father was put away. And after three days in the tomb, the Father rose Him up from the grave. Christ, by His own power, was raised to life. And my friends, He is alive today, never to die again. Death has no power over Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, John 11, four, uh, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if He dies. He rose again. And after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Christ ascended into heaven. And He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. And He is seated there now having completed the work of salvation once for all. And my friends, the call of the Gospel, the call to your soul, my friends, from Scripture, is to repent and believe. Repentance is a fleeing from sin, a resolve to turn from iniquity and transgression, a resolve to turn from rebellion, to, return, to turn from self-righteousness, to turn from pornography, to turn from drunkenness and drug abuse, to turn from those things and to believe. The call of the Gospel is to repent and to believe. To believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. That He is, he is the Sovereign King. To believe that He died and rose again on behalf of His people. And for all who do that, the promise of God is that their sins will be forgiven. All sin that they once had upon them, and even all future sin will be forgiven because of the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. That's why Jesus could say in Luke chapter 24 and verse 47, He could say to His disciples, Oh, excuse me, I'll begin in verse 46. He says, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, my friends. And not only that, but the promise of God is that God will impute the righteousness of Christ to those who believe Him. Now what I mean by impute is that God credits to their account the righteousness of the Son of God. God looks upon them, the Father looks upon the Christian as if He had lived Jesus' life because He looked at Jesus as if He lived the sinner's life. I receive Christ's righteousness because He took ownership of my sin. Christ takes my sin, I get His righteousness. That's the exchange of the Gospel, friends. Free grace! Free grace, my friends! All out of the free grace of God. Not an ounce of human effort goes into salvation. Even the faith that we have to grab hold of the righteousness of Christ is all of the free grace of God. My friends, Embrace the Son of God this day. And you must know this as well, especially you churchgoers, or perhaps those of you who grew up in church, you must know this, that the one who is genuinely converted will bear fruit of conversion. The one who has been truly saved by Jesus Christ's power, they, their lives will change. Their thoughts, their speech, 
their deeds will be changed. They'll love the Word of God in prayer and fellowshipping with the saints and sharing the gospel with the lost because God has given them a new heart with new desires. And the one who does not walk in righteousness is not born of God. By their deeds, they evidence the fact that they are lost, that they are dead in sin. I said I was a Christian for eight years, but I was lost. I was self-deceived. I was deluded. And that might be you. That might be you. Someone who perhaps has grown up in church. Confess Christ, but you do not live for Christ. Jesus said in, in Matthew 7, 21, He said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. And then ensuing verses, He says, And I will say to them, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Hey, John, I'm going to be done in about two minutes. Okay, good. They will be damned. Hypocrites have a special place in hell. And so, friends, if you're lost, if you see, you look at your actions, you look at your deeds, you look at your life, and you see, I'm a hypocrite, then the call of the gospel is for you to repent and believe. For you to repent and believe. If you do find, though, that you reflect true conversion by your actions, by your speech, by your heart's desire, then rejoice, brethren. Rejoice, my fellow saints, that your names are written in heaven. And this gospel is not only for the lost, it is for the church of Jesus Christ. It is for believers to feed upon day after day. It is for believers to feed upon, my friends, as their manna from heaven. It is for Christians. And it is for us to share with the lost, brethren. To share with the lost. All free grace. Salvation is all by the free mercy of God. So that God gets all glory. God gets all the honor. Jesus Christ is jealous for His own glory and praise. It is all for His glory. That's why Peter wrote, 2 Peter 3, he says in verse 18, he tells the Christians, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Please, you who are lost, look to Christ. You religious hypocrites, look to Christ. You who are saved, look to Christ. For some of you it is looking unto Christ for salvation, and others it is looking unto Christ for sanctification. So we have seen here in Romans 3, verses 7 and 8. That God is just. That even in the punishment of the wicked, God's justice and righteousness is manifested for His own glory. That God is a holy and righteous God. We've seen the subject of our sin and God's truth discussed in these two verses. We've also considered that though we have all sinned and we deserve hell, God the Son, Jesus Christ, came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. And so to Him be all glory and praise and honor forever and ever. Amen and amen.